Thank you, Mr. White. Good to hear your testimony. I will begin the uh, questioning. I yield myself five minutes. Uh, I noticed from a lot of the testimony that there is a certain overlap between uh, substance abuse and incarceration and, and in uh, getting people back on their feet, dealing with that problem. That, that's sort of the, the angle that, that look, all, all the members up here, all the members of this committee uh, work this issue. We, we deal with the families, with the inmates as well, uh, trying to get them closer to home, trying to work out uh, the job situation. It's especially difficult right now, as, as a number of you have, have, have uh, recognized. In my district, uh, we, we actually confronted this uh, from the perspective of a, an Oxycontin and heroin epidemic in, in my district. And what we had to do was, uh, well, what I did was establish uh, uh, two homes, two transition homes, but our offender group was getting so young that uh, we were dealing with adolescents. And you just can't co-locate kids with, with adult offenders. So uh, we ended up establishing uh, two homes, like Mr. Reynolds had to establish uh, the Cushing House for Girls, uh, which was a rehab facility for girls, not all ex-offenders, but uh, all with similar problems, and, and one for boys. So I, I certainly understand what you're grappling with. Sometimes it seems overwhelming. But uh, uh, fortunately, we do have some employers, and I know you probably have your favorites as well, uh, ironically, I have a, uh, a brewery, the Harpoon Brewery, which is uh, located in my district. And I know it may sound like cruel and unusual punishment to have somebody come out of uh, a facility and then go to work at a brewery. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just want to say that they, they are someone who recognizes, and I, and I tell them, this person is coming out of a, a rehab facility. And uh, we're going to try them out and see if we can get that first job to build a work history. And God bless them, uh, you know, and, and I know you all have employers that you work with to get people out to work, and sometimes that's the biggest hurdle, just transition, uh, just making that connection back to a, a, a normal life for, for some of the folks we're trying to help. Uh, let me ask uh, a general question of the entire panel, my time, uh, and I want to talk about the nexus and, and at reintegration, and Mr. White has, has picked up on this in his own personal uh, situation. Uh, time and time again, I hear about uh, the way uh, folks coming out of the, uh, Bureau, the Federal Bureau of Prisons and uh, their D.C. code offenders, and yet they're placed in facilities that are uh, a significant different, uh, distance from their homes and that whole support system. Uh, and so families can't. Uh, visit them. There, there's a disconnect between that support system. Uh, uh, can each of you, uh, as briefly as possible, uh, respond to this claim that there, there is a, a significant uh, disadvantage or detriment to, to offenders who are coming out and are being located a significant distance from their, their homes and from their families? Uh, and how does that play on the uh, halfway house situation and uh, what you're seeing. Uh, Mr. Eichenlaub. Thank you. Uh, I'll say, first of all, um, we have 40, we try and place the offenders, all offenders, including D.C. offenders, within 500 miles of their residence. We have 40 federal facilities within 500 miles of the District of Columbia. 75% of D.C. offenders are, in fact, incarcerated within 500 miles. I realize, I recognize that uh, that can be a substantial drive even within 500 miles. 500 miles is a, is a, is a long, long, they could be in Boston. Can be up to eight hours. Yeah. So the majority are within 500 miles, perhaps even closer in West Virginia or Kentucky. Um, and then a, a substantial number at the Rivers Correctional Institution down in North Carolina, which is much closer. Um, the, 
the other 25 percent who aren't within that 500 mile radius, the standard we try to follow, may have been involved in some type of violence or misconduct that resulted in them having to go to a higher security level prison that may be further away. If they need specialized medical or mental health treatment, that may take them further away as well. Okay. Um, but having spent a number of years working in our facilities, I recognize the importance of visiting and maintaining relationships with families, and it's great to see in our visiting rooms when those relationships are there. Okay. Ms. Poteet? A large portion of the offenders are at Rivers, and we find it very beneficial. Uh, we have about 700 or so there, and we have the opportunity to visit Rivers Correctional Facility uh, at least two times a year and sometimes more, where our case managers go down and we can do our preliminary assessments there. And I know that the families are able to travel there as well. We also take some of our vendors or support systems down so the offenders have the opportunity to meet some of them prior to being released. And we do video conferencing from there. And we find it's very important to link them to the services as well as the families prior to their release to the community. And some of our video conferences, we have had the families present as well as our mentors there as well so that we connect them there. Thank you. Ms. Levine? I can't underscore enough the importance of family in successful reentry. Um, at the Urban Institute, we conducted a longitudinal study of prisoner reentry in four different states. We looked at all kinds of factors that might predict the reentry success or failure, including the degree to which they had family available to support them both financially and emotionally. And what we found that was that those who indicated that they had strong family support were much more successful in staying crime-free, um, staying off drugs, finding jobs, and so forth. Um, I, what's important to note in this is that um, family support can be enhanced through increased visitation, more access uh, to the prisoners when they're behind bars. And I think it also relates to some of the research I mentioned in my formal statement where um, the researchers found that halfway houses were not um, effective for low-risk offenders. They were actually le more detrimental than having them back in their, with their families and communities. And I think we heard that as much from Mr. White, that as much as there were great services available to him, they, it also created additional barriers to him. And I, I understand from his statement that he does have a supportive family. So I, I just want to underscore again, thinking very carefully about how you use the scarce resources of halfway houses, especially if those houses aren't close to where people live or create barriers when they're trying to go to and from their jobs. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Chairman, uh, when we look at distances in the district, the problem is, I think, that for the women and the females, females are a bit different uh, from the male population. Uh, the females are housed at Danbury, Connecticut, Philadelphia, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, Alderson, West Virginia, and Tallahassee, Florida. And if you noticed in my official uh, presentation, I talked about homelessness, homelessness, shelters of where these people go. And when you think about it, one of the problems and one of the things that we get constantly from our females is that they are mothers. Um, they have been away from their children for so long. They don't know them. They've got to regain that confidence. Usually an aunt or grandmother or some other individual has taken care of their children. It's a very difficult situation. Uh, and one of the things is that most of these individuals come from very menial positions. They, the families don't have money to travel to these locations to be able to visit them even if they wanted to. Yeah. So we have a very diffi difficult and unique problem as it relates to that. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Farron. Mr. Chairman, I echo some of the uh, same comments that my colleagues here at the table have mentioned to you. I wanted just to let you know that uh, we we at Hope Village also believe that family reunification is very important. We do it in, and we promote it in a couple of different ways. Um, we promote visitation right at, right at the facility several times a week um, to allow families to come in and re reunite with their loved ones. Uh, we have our social workers. There's a requirement in our program that requires our social workers to go out and do host visits. 
So when the family, when the, when the offender is going to be releasing to that uh, particular uh, house, that uh, they understand what it's all involved uh, from, both, from both angles. Um, we also have a transitional skills and journaling program. It's a nine-week it's a nine-week mandatory program that was started three years ago in our, in our program. Um, and those uh, sections that uh, we cover such topics as uh, social influences, authority figures, <coughs> anger and time management, creating a safety net, and these residents are allowed or offenders are allowed to write in their journals so that they would be able to then uh, make use of that uh, with their own private thoughts. That's great. Thank you. Mr. White. <laughs> Um, well, there is, I guess, family and visitation, that's one of those things when there's a direct correlation between, um, you know, the prison and the coming home and possibly recidivizing, I, I, I think. I know I was in um, a relative, relatively close Bureau of Prison uh, place in Hopewell, Virginia. Uh, many people are much, much further than that. But even to come and see me, um, whomever it might be had to, uh, in essence, wipe out an entire day. You know, they had to plan for the two and a half to three hour trip up, spend the time there, then the two, two and a half to three hour drive back, which doesn't leave much, even if you had the energy, there probably just wouldn't be the time. Uh, and then once, when it's time to go to the halfway house, we, we uh, are anticipating these visitations, which we only receive in, uh, individually one hour a week, depending on the, the building in which you stay at Hope Village. Um, and for some, the frustration comes if, you know, I know my first uh, home visit was denied, although I had followed the rules, I had, you know, found employment and what have you. Um, they said, oh, well, well it's, it's too close to the weekend to be able to approve your home visit. And that, that was a very great source of frustration to me because I had already told everyone and everyone had planned to come over to, to uh, the place where I would be staying, uh, you know, to spend the evening, have dinner. And so Friday afternoon when they told me, oh, you're not going to be able to go home this weekend, I was very frustrated. Um, and many other inmates may feel something beyond frustration, even anger. I've seen it, you know, myself. They, you know, they come back into the quarters and they're angry, they're cursing, and they're, and they're just angry. Um, but it is, I mean, family is very important. It is very important, uh, and it's, it's one of those hot buttons. And um, so if, you know, if the family, you know, for those who have a support system, people who are willing to visit them, it really could guide, uh, guide them in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. White. I want to welcome Mr. Gao uh, to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have another meeting to go to, so if you don't mind, I can just go ahead and ask my question. Um, I represent the second district of Louisiana, which comprised of New Orleans, and there is an interest in building a halfway house in an area of New Orleans East, which was very much devastated by Katrina, uh, and the people are coming back uh, to rebuild there is a lack of a, a police force out there uh, in the New Orleans East region. Um, so people are somewhat anxious and fearful of having a halfway house in an area where there is already a lack of uh, security. Uh, my question to members of the panel is, uh, what, is the, what are some of the security risks of, of halfway houses, even though I'm pretty sure that such institutions are beneficial and necessary? Um, would you recommend that a halfway house be built in an area recovering from uh, Katrina and lacking uh, a, an, an, an adequate uh, security force? I think that but, those questions are probably good for Mr. Eichenlob and, and Ms. Poteet. We have, as uh, Congresswoman Norton knows, we have some difficulty placing halfway houses around um, the community here uh, because people don't want them in their backyard in many cases. Um, and we try and find a balance between addressing the release needs of the offenders against the risk of placing them in the community. So we rely heavily on the accounti accountability procedures that the residential reentry centers have in place, which requires them under our contract to 
have 24-hour day accountability for the inmates in whether that's at their job site or uh, in the actual residential residential reentry center itself. So I would leave it at that. If you can uh, address the question, as I have a very specific question. Do you recommend that a halfway house be built in an area where people are recovering and lack and, and lack a, an adequate security uh, force to protect the people? I'm, I'm, I just want a direct answer. Is that a question for me to the panel? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to respond. Sure, Mr. Reynolds, take a crack uh, at even it. Even though I'm with a halfway house and I might get hit over the head, um, we have facilities uh, that are located in upscale communities and those that are in low-risk areas and high-risk areas. And I think the key to it is good communications with the community and uh, working with the political and economic structure within that area to get them comfortable with a halfway house or residential reentry center. Uh, whoever the supplier of those services are, we have to go in and get them ready, when I say we, the halfway house owners, to get the community ready to accept it. I just did an uh, opening of a new halfway house in an area that uh, was of high risk. And what I did was I went into the area, I met with all of the community leaders, I met with all the political officials, and everyone that had a stake in what is going to happen there. And I was successful without having any opposition. And there, at that time, there were no halfway house regulations that provided for a halfway house to be in that location. So I think the answer to your question is you need to be able to pull all factions together because there is adequate uh, security within the halfway house and adequate follow through. And you would not know that it is a halfway house of those facilities that I run. Thank that you, Mr. Helps. White. May I? Um, it is, in my opinion, um, the security issue is, is uh, I guess, from my experience, not too much of an issue from the inmate perspective. Um, the people who, uh, by and large, the people who are residents at the halfway houses are already used to a certain regimen, being on a short lease through, you know, whatever prison they've come. Um, and for the most part, everyone is just looking to get through their time and get back home. So while there is, of course, a small population of people who, uh, in, in any halfway house, will break the rules, will not come back, for the most part, um, you don't really have to worry about the inmates running amok in, you know, in this neighborhood. While, you know, I, I, I assume this is the direction that you're heading, the, the, in, the residents themselves as a security risk. Is that correct? The, the residents fear that the halfway house would, would increase crime in an area where there's already lacking of security. Right. Well, and, and I think that's, that's kind of where I'm heading. The, the residents of the halfway house, by and large, are not looking <coughs> to commit crimes while housed in the halfway house. They're looking to finish their sentence and go wherever it is that they need to go from there. Thank you, Mr. White. The chair recognizes Mr. Eleanor Holmes Dorton for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, Mr. Mr. White's testimony uh, is a, in, in a real sense, uh, uh, sets a predicate for some of what I want to ask uh, uh, enforcement authorities. I have found that even when people are very troubled, like they come to a community meeting and they're dead set on something they're angry about, lay out the rules, be very transparent with them, they help you enforce the rules. Uh, what, they, what they resent is not knowing how the rules are applied and then, then of course, feeling that they've been unfairly treated. And that's really dangerous when you're talking about people who have just gotten out of prison. Your own testimony says that's when they're most ready uh, to be integrated. And here's what I don't understand. Who gets to decide who goes to a halfway house and who doesn't? Could I have a straightforward answer, Mr. Uh, uh, Eichenlaub? Who gets to decide? Is it you? And if it is you, what specifically are the criteria for deciding 
who gets it and who doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. the, every inmate appears before his or her uh, what we call their unit team, which is comprised of their correctional counselor. A no, case I'm asking you, who gets to decide it? Is it the, the BOP? I only have so much time. Does the BOP get to make that decision while people are in prison? Yes, we do the referral. Yeah, the BOP gets to make the, does the BOP have written criteria that I could go to tomorrow to say this, these are the kinds of inmates that Ms. Proteate and the halfway house uh, leaders have to look forward to receiving? And what are those criteria? Could you spell them out and just list them for me? We have a policy that describes that, yes and each case is evaluated on the merits of the individual um, and the needs of the individual. So, <laughs> I hope they are. I hope Absolutely. this is individualized, but I'm looking for at least some baseline criterion that would make me understand high risk, low risk, uh, uh, been in jail a long time, like the ones Ms. Prode talked about, just been in jail. I'm looking for something other than what you just told me, Mr. Eichenlaub. Uh, Congresswoman Norton, there is nothing specific that says if you've been incarcerated for 20 years, you get 180 days or uh, 12 months. Uh, there's nothing specific that says if you're incarcerated for this offense, you get this period of time. We have the flexibility built into our program that enables us to assess the needs of the offender right, so and there place are no him criteria him. for deciding. We've heard, we've heard testimony from Ms. Levine that low-risk low risk, uh, offenders tend to do better in the community. I would have expected that at least that criterion would be one the BOP would use. I, I am troubled uh, by, by no straightforward general criteria. Everything gets tailored, but if they're not general criteria, then I have to assume that sometimes there, is, 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 uh, there are decisions made uh, which may appear not to be fair, but let me say to the, the halfway house leaders, do you get to choose or select who gets admission to your halfway house? We receive a dossier on each uh, client uh, that is proposed to the halfway house, and we have a right to accept or reject based upon the certain criteria. But we do not have Based it. upon what criteria? Other well, the basic criteria. like getting admission to UDC or to Yale. You get to, you, the, you, you get to they say thumbs down on some people, even though the BOP has said this is an appropriate person to go into the halfway house. No, what happens is that in our location, we have people who review those particular things to make sure that they would fit into the halfway house environment that we run. So what about you, what, what about you Mr. Reynolds, I believe it is? Oh, Mr. Perone, I'm sorry. It's the same. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, this is, it seems to me a double whammy here, uh, and I'm, I'm concerned about uh, what appear not to be even, even rough criteria for placing people in halfway houses, and then uh, wide open selection criteria by the halfway houses. Do these halfway houses all have to provide the same core services, Mr. Eichenlaub? Yes. So if they all provide the same core services, does your contract mandate that anything about who gets accepted or not? Or, or is this a wide open selection process like being admitted to any private institution? The contracts are negotiated based on six factors, and within that negotiation, uh, there is some, uh, there can be some criteria established for who can and cannot be uh, accepted. Aggressive sex offenders, for example, there may be like. Mr. Eichenlaub, I'm very, I'm, I'm very concerned about this, what, what seems to be um, wide open criteria on both ends. But let me give you an example. There has been testimony here that one of the, one of the, the threshold problems of people getting out of prison is they don't even have identification. Sososa saw that that was a problem for getting anywhere, and Sososa apparently worked out uh, a situation with the, with the district uh, with their, to get non-drivers uh, IDs. Then the BOP terminated this program. Could you give me any reason if the, if the District of Columbia 
A few years ago, uh, non-drivers were allowed. Now they are, we are told they're not. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that issue, but I'd be happy to follow up and provide a response in writing to the subcommittee. I'd appreciate it if, 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 if you would. Um, I, I'm concerned about Ms. Protiate, Protiate's testimony because she said that there were 500 additional D.C. felons returning here. Now, what she's talking about, of course, are the, the infamous sentencing guidelines. Uh, and that wasn't, that, I don't, I'm not sure that that was a, a mistake any of, of if you're talking about the felons who are yes, going to be coming out and they are federal felons. That's correct. And indicated that, that seemed to indicate that there would be some difficulty in receiving such a large number. Mr. Eichenlaub, are those felons coming, do you know uh, in what, how those felons are coming to the District of Columbia? Are they coming in large numbers? Are they coming in small trickles? Have you been in touch with Sosa about how you will indeed uh, handle these felons? Have you been in touch with the halfway houses about how these felons will be matriculated back into civil society? We've dealt with circumstances such as this in the past when federal laws have uh, applied retroactively and resulted in offenders being released. And I'm confident that with the, our relationship with CSOSA and the uh, halfway house providers, well, we can accommodate Ms. testimony, them. I know I'm at the end of my time. She, she indicated, she raised the issue herself and indicated concern about so many folks. Now, you could alleviate that concern, for example, if you could tell us, yes, they're coming back but they're not coming back all at one time, or they'll be coming back in small numbers. No, can you tell us anything about these felons who will be coming back to the District of Columbia in larger numbers than usually come back uh, in, in the form of D.C. code of, of offenders? The rate at which they come out will be dependent upon the conditions uh, and the release procedures that the Parole Commission establishes for them. So I couldn't say when they're coming. Uh, past experience suggests they're staggered when they come out, and I'm confident we can accommodate that with our, again, in collaboration with our partners here. I, I know my time is out, Mr. Chairman, so. Uh... Okay, thank you. Excuse me, um, um, Congressman <clears throat> Norton, I'd like to clarify something for the record in regards to the nine drivers identifications. That was a contract that we had with the city, but DMV is the one that terminated that and BOP will need to go back and negotiate Why it. Why did they terminate the contract? They said that because they are federal prisoners in a halfway house, they would not allow them to get the non-district driver's license. But I have spoken with the director of Bureau of Prisons, and he said that he would do a memorandum of understanding with the district and possibly piggyback on ours so that they can do that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say, it, 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 memoranda of understanding have often kept the BOP uh, from simply doing what is necessary. Uh, uh, to do, if all it took was a, was a memorandum of understanding, I don't know why it would not have been considered a very urgent matter not to have any cessation in getting the, uh, the IDs to people just getting out of prison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would simply, on that matter with the driver's licenses, I would, I would just ask that that be a three-way conversation between this committee and uh, the Bureau of Prisons and the DMV to make sure that it's, it's addressed in a expeditious manner. We can't leave this out there, okay? So we can sort of close that loop. And if it's a memorandum of understanding that gets it accomplished, then, then we'll work that. If it sounds like there may be a need for, <coughs> excuse me, some regulatory refinement or legislation uh, with respect to the standards uh, that are employed in terms of uh, reentry. I understand the situation with, as you mentioned, the the circumstances with an aggressive sex offender. That matter must be treated, uh, you know, distinguished. However, that's a very, that, that's one outlier. Uh, the, the standards for everyone else are still fairly vague, as, as, as uh, Congresswoman uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton has noted. Chair recognizes Mr. Connolly for five minutes. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was out of order. Uh, <coughs> Chair recognizes Mr. Chaffetz for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Uh, thank you all for being here. I, I truly do appreciate it. And I, I particularly want to thank uh, Mr. White uh, for your, your composure and your courage for being here. I'm, 
I'm sure a few years ago, if somebody had suggested to you that you were going to be testifying before Congress, you would have said, yeah, right. And the New Orleans Saints are going to be in the Super Bowl, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, I applaud you both. And I really do uh, appreciate it. I, I'm sure we can hear about all the positive attributes from the other members on the panel, not to take away anything that, but in, in, in the few minutes that I do have, what I'd really like to hear from your heart, and as candidly as, as you can, offer some suggestions and perspectives in, in somewhat of a critical way, but in a, in a constructive cr criticism, if you would, of things that you think should happen or things that weren't quite flowing as well as, as, as you could, all in the spirit of trying to make it better, because I think that's what we're all here to help do. So can you share that, your personal perspective and what you saw yourself went through, but maybe others went through as well, and things that can be done to, be, to improve the system? Um, thank you. Uh, well, unfortunately, there is no quick fix, no band-aid for this. It's, it is a very difficult thing to do. Um, in my experience, I, I, I think that everything should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And just based on the numbers of people uh, coming out, and I guess the, the, the ratio of, of um, staff to resident or staff to inmate, depending on you know, how you want to say it, um, it's, it's just not that easy. But change is not change is never easy, especially when you are trying to really shift, uh, really make a, a, a an overhaul of a situation and 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 curb recidivism at a at a significant. But if you if you could do one thing, what would be the number one thing you'd like to see done? The number one thing um, that I would see done is. Just to um, to simply have it have it uh, seem that uh, the halfway house system cares. And and tell me about the the flexibility here, because here you go and you find a job, mm -hmm. and I recognize the need to go through the drug. I don't know if that was you know, counseling or testing or whatever it might be, but you know you have to leave work early. You finally got a job. You've got an employer who's uh, gracious enough uh, in a very tough economy but to hire somebody. To expand a little bit more about that experience and what should be done in that way to help the employer help you and also do the training and things that they need to do well um, one thing that was of concern for me was that they didn't offer these programs over the weekend when I didn't necessarily have to work of course that would cut into my home visit time but they're required programs and at least I would have that option it would either cut into my work which uh, as I said, is, you know, my, my employers, they look the other way, but they're like, so you, you have to leave early, twice a week, this early? Or I could, you know, I could take this uh, hour and a half to two hours during my weekend. You know, I would have that option. I would opt to take it over the weekend because I need my job. At some point, I will be going home for good, you know. So I, can, I wouldn't mind cutting into those visitations a little bit uh, as important, you know, even though they were important to me. Um, but that was that was a uh, an issue with that, you know. The end, um, as I said, you know, you they they give you a set limit of time uh, from destination, uh, from point of origin to destination, from halfway house to work, and from work to halfway house. Um, working in Fairfax, I had to take, you know, a bus and then a series of trains and then another bus each way, and so it didn't allow for any missing of buses or missing of trains or you know my. my my bus came about 10 minutes after I was due to be off work, so I really had to run, you know, four or five blocks to the bus in order to make it because it, it only ran every 45 minutes in that area uh, of Fairfax. And so a little more flexibility in the time, as I said, based you know, on a case by case, you just can't lump everyone into one box. You know, we all have different, you know, needs and they need to be met. I would just suggest if you have any other thoughts or anecdotes or any other suggestions along the way, I appreciate you being here, but if, you, if at some point you do have other suggestions, to be able to submit those to this committee, they would be invaluable. I uh, appreciate your perspective. I wish you nothing but the best, and, and thank you very much uh, uh, for being here. I'll yield thank back you, the balance of my time. Sure. Thank you. Chair recognize Mr. Connolly for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, thank you to the panelists for participating, and especially you, Mr. White, I, I thank you for your courage in sharing your story and uh, proud of the fact that my home county, Fairfax County, is uh, 
uh, a place willing to uh, invest in you and, and others. Uh, and I pray and hope you will stay on the righteous path. Uh, Mr. Eichenlaub, picking up where Del uh, Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, left off, did I understand you in response to Representative uh, Norton to say that there are no criteria by BOP in terms of who goes into a halfway house? There, let me clarify. There, and I'm going to ask you I to may. pull that microphone closer because I cannot hear you. Thank you. Uh, there are some criteria. For example, if an offender has pending charges or detainers, they can't go to a halfway Those house. Those are criteria for not going. Right. There are other criteria for screening people and saying, here's a good candidate for, uh, you know, rehabilitation and the avoidance of recidivism. That, that's correct. And I would respect. No, I'm sorry. What's correct? Okay. That's correct that there are no specific criteria that says if you are this type of offender, this is what you get. That's amazing. There are no criteria for who goes into a halfway house? So you're just rolling the dice? I would respectfully submit that our policy enables us to do the kind of thing that Mr. White is suggesting, which is each offender is evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis to make an assessment as to what his or her specific needs are, and then we place them based on what uh, their needs are. If I understood Ms. Levine's testimony, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Levine, uh, you indicated that uh, individuals who were deemed medium and high risk actually derive the greatest benefit from halfway house participation. And let me ask Mr. Eichenlob and Ms. Protea, that seems counterintuitive. What would you comment? I'll defer to you because I've already spoken. I, mean, I think for the average citizen, person at lowest risk would be the best candidate for going, you know, uh, you know, not a violent crime or whatever it may be, that's the person who's probably going to benefit the most from the halfway house and have the highest chance of success in reintegration. And yet, if I understood Ms. Levine, not, not necessarily. And, and, and by the way, that, that's a heartening thing to hear, but I'm just wondering if you'd comment a little bit, because I think for the average citizen, including myself, that seems a little counterintuitive. Yes, I, I continue to say would be your high-risk offenders. For instance, someone that has spent a significant period of time in, in prison, someone that has uh, nowhere to live because the family ties have been broken, someone without employable skills, did not take the benefit of the service in, in the prison system, and there is coming, coming out unemployable, uh, someone that lacks financial support and family support, um, someone that is, uh, has violent a violent crime, you may want to put them in the halfway house for a gradual transition before they are going out into the community. And then we give them, a, we can have a time to assess and determine and look, link them up with their services before they're actually sent home. Um, oftentimes, these men may, while well, I'm speaking particularly to the men right now, may be coming out and they've burnt their bridges. And the families even have moved and so there's nowhere for them to live in the District of Columbia, then we have to put them in a shelter or find alternative housing, whether it's transitional housing or so forth. So it gives us adequate time to link them up and better prepare them to a positive reintegration into the community before just coming right out. I agree. Uh, one of the things that bothers me, uh, you know, we closed the Lorton Prison, uh, a, an absolute correct thing to do. However, there were understandings at the time that efforts would be made to try to make sure that uh, inmates from that prison and future uh, visitors to that facility uh, would be housed cl you know, relatively close to the District of Columbia for all the right reasons in terms of family visits and, and so forth. Um, but as a matter of fact, D.C. prisoners are now scattered, in, as I understand it, as many as 33 states? I, I don't know that number specifically, but that's feasible. Is that good public policy from your point of view, Mr. Eichenlaub? We try and keep them as close to home as possible. Many are in Rivers Correctional Institution, North Carolina, um, our correctional institutions in uh, Western Maryland and Virginia, so the majority, I think, are, are actually closer than that. Well, what would be the reason why somebody would be many hundreds of miles away? If they need specialized medical or mental health treatment, 
they could go to one of our medical facilities where they get that treatment. Uh, if they um, have been in an, a fight with another individual from whom they need to be separated, that may result in them traveling further away. Uh, if they have been disruptive and we don't have a facility that's appropriate for their level of supervision that's necessary, that may result in them going Is further away. Is it also a capacity problem? Uh, bed space is tight. Mr. Chairman, I can't tell whether I have any time left or not. You don't, but we're, we're I thank you, Chairman. It's quite all right, uh, Mr. Varone. I wanted to ask you. You know, you have a a, a commendable record, uh, especially over the the, the uh, last year, last couple of years, um, and the rearrest record post release. And I was just trying to drill down on some of that data. How many of the uh, folks that you're talking about? There was like 1,157 people that you had come in and, and, and go through, the, go, go through uh, Hope Village, and uh, only nine of them were rearrested in the following six months after release. How many of those folks are the Bureau of Prisons folks? Um, I'm not, at this point, Mr. Chairman, able to give you that information. I can research that. Oh, okay. But I believe that m if most, if not all of them, were BOP people. Really? Yeah. Okay, that's a you know that's a that's a commendable record, and I'm just trying to figure out uh, if we can replicate some of the things that you're doing over there. You mentioned the seven-day uh, orientation when people come in. You you spend a lot of time figuring out what the nature of their needs are, and uh, maybe, and you can you can explain this. Maybe you're finding out what they need in a more thorough fashion. And by addressing those specific needs, maybe that's paying off on the other end, so that the time that they spend with you is uh, is more meaningful. Do you have any any thoughts about that? What is the magic of your? Uh, it's not magic. It's it's hard work. But what is the uh, what is the key component of your success? I, I deal a lot with the recovery and and uh, rehab community, and those numbers are are stunning. But what do you think are the? Uh, uh, I mean, all all of you are doing wonderful work. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, you know, but, but uh, I just think that that's a remarkable uh, outcome that you're achieving there. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my only direct answer to you is commitment and dedication to helping people because at the end of the day, we're all citizens of the United States of America. We live in the greatest country of the world. And when an individual commits a crime, um, they serve their sentence, they're coming back. And they're coming back to our communities. And so we've got to figure out ways to help that individual make a good transition so that they are, and they do become productive members of society like you and I. Um, I believe that we've taken our job, we take it very seriously. Uh, we look at assessing this individual um, from a day-to-day -day standpoint to make sure that they we put them in a position to be successful. Um, that isn't always the case with all individuals. Some individuals come to us with, you know, agendas already formulated. Um, so I believe that for those individuals that want to do a good job, want to take the program serious, want to become a better productive member of society, open up to our case managers and our specialized people that we have on staff and the partnerships that we've formulated in the community, I think when you encompass all that, you put out a good product. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Reynolds, having been involved with, with, you know, a, with programs and actually established a home uh, to, to help women making that transition, uh, as you mentioned in your initial testimony, a lot of these uh, folks coming out, the females are moms, and uh, that creates a dynamic that uh, is is sometimes very difficult to to address, especially when there's a there's a distance here between uh, their their homes and and where they're where they're uh, at a halfway house. What, what, are, what do you think are the most important uh, changes that we might make 
in order to uh, in order to achieve better outcomes for the women that we're trying to serve. I think the first thing that we have to look at, uh, Chairman, is the length of time that the females spend within the facility. Also, to make sure that we have the wraparound services that are needed right at the facility. Uh, give you an example, and probably God made this happen, and you asked the right question. Uh, this morning, uh, we were at the facility about 7:30. And a young lady came stumping up the steps and passed me, and I asked her to stop for a second. Asked her about four or five times. She wouldn't stop. She continued. And then I went downstairs, and I stood with her and talked with her. And she wouldn't acknowledge me at all for about five minutes. But finally, I got through to her. And one of her problems was anger anger within herself and we have a lot of that and we have the relationship with the mother to the children they've been divorced from the children they still have a desire to be with the male so there's a lot of complications that we need to deal with and we need someone like a psychiatrist or a psychologist right on site to be able to help them deal with those issues immediately yeah. Uh, so yeah. that would be some of the things that I'd look at. And then the after yeah. tracking. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Chairman has spoken about some of the statistics that were in the testimony. Um, you yourself, you, Ms. Levine, testified uh, that halfway houses appear to have uh, quite uh, different uh, effects. Um, in your view, do best practices, do halfway houses, I'm sorry, make a difference? Uh, does it matter to, to matriculate people through a halfway house? Yeah, I think they can make a difference. Um, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but this whole issue of risk level I think is a really important one. Um, Mr. Connolly asked about the low risk uh, offenders and how come they weren't getting any benefit out of the halfway houses. Well, it's by definition of the fact that they're already low risk. So you're putting people in places where they don't need to be because they already have a good uh, odds of well, being your successful. You, you testified, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was very important to hear this testimony because uh, Mr. Connolly was right, and perhaps uh, for lay people like ourselves. Uh, uh, is counterintuitive. Um, I, I understand that, but I'm not sure BOP does, because mm -hmm. BOP didn't testify that it is using those criteria. Right. In fact, could I ask you, uh, and I ask this very respectably, Mr. Eichenkopf, I have been impressed with the use of best practices within the BOP. Do you use best practices when it comes to uh, uh, halfway houses? I don't hear the metrics. Uh, I don't hear the criteria. Uh, and so it is hard for the committee to know uh, how we should evaluate halfway houses. And so I must ask you, how do you evaluate halfway houses? Which of these halfway houses, how would you rate these halfway houses? And on what metric uh, are you basing that evaluation? And do you tell them how you have evaluated them? and what they need to do to improve or what they have done that is best. Thank you. We, we absolutely do that. At the time that we established the contract with these organizations, we, as I mentioned previously, we have six factors on which they're evaluated. Accountability, programs, community relations, site validity and su suitability, safety issues, life safety issues, personnel and communication. Those are the criteria on which we evaluate these organizations. And uh, we audit those regularly, three times a year, and then a comprehensive evaluation once a year. Well, could I ask the halfway house leaders here, if, if, given the testimony of Mr. White, testimony reinforced by uh, work the committee did in, in trying to uh, in, in, in visiting the halfway houses and in trying to uh, get witnesses. Uh, could you um, uh, commit to this committee that um, uh, some of the rigidity that Mr. White testified uh, to, uh, for example, when an inmate has a, 
has a um, job uh, or is willing on the weekend uh, to, in fact, um, uh, do what would otherwise be required to do during job time, would you, would you be willing to commit to uh, a, a second look at some of the rigidities that apparently uh, are to be found in halfway houses in light of particularly the job situation and how frustrated an inmate can be when, uh, yes, surrounded by rules, but rules that keep him from contact with his family or keep him uh, from, in fact, uh, getting the kind of job record that we all believe is necessary? Are you willing to look at your own uh, procedures to make sure those rigidities are not simply built in? Absolutely, Congresswoman Norton. We, um, in order to be a better organization, you have to continually look at those types of things. Um, if I may, just to go into a little bit of detail, the privatization part of, of this business is such that if you don't do well, you're not going to be in business. Um, it's just the way the federal government... Well, look, I understand that, but I also understand, look, let's be, <laughs> let's be clear. We can't get halfway houses in other, in other communities in the district as badly as we need them. Therefore, BOP is going to have to do the best job it can in order to make sure you do the best job. It's not like the ordinary contract, and you, you, you know it. Uh, the fees, about fees, I understand the fees, but Mr. White's testimony, they had to pay a fee uh, for living there even uh, until his release date, even if he wasn't living there. Would you clarify that for me, please, how that could possibly be the case? I believe that the fee that Mr. White is referring to as the subsistence fee that the Bureau of Prisons requires all federal inmates to uh, pay for well, a well, portion I, of their maybe cost Mr. of care. Maybe Mr. White clarify. Mr. White, were, were you saying you were no longer living or, or, or doing or, or receiving subsistence from the halfway house but were required to pay, what is it, 25 percent? or whatever is the amount. And by the way, who sets that amount? Go ahead, Mr. White. Um, yes, that was uh, when I went to uh, finish the rest of my halfway house, receiving any services from the halfway house, but I was still required to pay. Well, you're going to have to to me to make me understand that given, given how few resources these, uh, these ex-offenders have. Could you explain that? Uh, you were living at, I guess, at Hope Village, so let me ask you to explain it, Mr. Barone. Again, Congresswoman, we take our direction from the Bureau of Prisons. Um, okay, now the buck has been passed to you, Mr. Eichenbaum, <laughs> so catch it here. <laughs> Why would an ex-offender who had a family good enough to feed him while he's looking for a job, to help him with his subsistence, be paying money to a private contractor who is providing nothing toward his subsistence? And wouldn't that turn you off if you were in the position of this ex-offender? One of the things we try and encourage among our offenders is acceptance of personal responsibility for their conduct. Just a moment, sir. <laughs> I pay because I live well. That's where I pay my mortgage. I pay rent because I live there. Now, how does it increase the personal responsibility of the inmate to pay for what he is not receiving? We believe that they're demonstrating personal responsibility and accepting responsibility by paying a subsistence amount for their uh, residents. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, you indicated that we may need some. If we are not able to get the Bureau of Prisons to give us a better answer than that, then it, it may be that we need a statutory change here. Um, the notion of making an, an inmate pay for what he does not receive runs counter to personal responsibility. That's exactly what the inmate was doing before. He was taking what he wasn't supposed to take, what he wasn't receiving. Um, and it, 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 if, if it makes me angry, <laughs> I can't imagine what, what people who have anger problems must feel when they say you don't live here, you don't eat here, and you're going to pay anyway. And, I, and, and all I can ask you to do is this. 
understand that you are not the director of the Bureau of Prisons. I will be writing the Bureau of Prisons. The chairman has already indicated that uh, we will be doing follow-up. But I ask you to um, review this policy so, uh, so that we, if anything, can encourage families to take over the subsistence responsibility. And if I may say so, Mr. Eichenlaub, so we save the taxpayers of the United States some of the funds. After all, Sosa will continue to have jurisdiction uh, because this person is on supervised release. So I find it hard to understand, uh, given all we know about a modern penology, how this, this, this requirement does anything but run counter to all we understand about my modern penology. So I ask you, are you willing uh, to review this policy? I respect your opinion. We'll take a look at it. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have to confess I do struggle with the concept that uh, someone might uh, serve their sentence, submit to, to a halfway house, and complete that program, and then uh, return home and yet still pay into a system that they're already uh, they've already completed. I'm not sure that it, just with this exchange that I understand the whole situation. So uh, I would ask uh, uh, you, Mr. Eichenlaub, uh, Ms. Poteet, uh, Mr. Verone, uh, if you, and Mr. White, if I could get um, a sense of your own personal view of this and what is required. Uh, it does seem counterintuitive at, at, at this level, but again, we haven't really drilled down much much on the issue. I'd like to find out what the policy is that we're following there and whether or not uh, this is a, an anomaly in Mr. White's case or if this is something that happens across the board with all, with all of our, our inmates and, uh, and those who are, are trying to gain reentry. I just don't understand enough about it and we, we, we haven't called for votes. The other uh, piece I want to say in conclusion is just that uh, I understand the statement that uh, there are no hard and fast uh, standards uh, that we apply to each individual and that we, but you, you also say that we we take each case each person on a case-by-case -case basis but there needs to be standards applied on a case-by-case -case basis I would I would imagine it, it can't be simply random and thinking up new new standards every time a new person is is uh, is assessed so uh, I, I think it would be helpful in tracking and in, in, in identifying best practices if, if you said, okay, this is a group that we look at and we think they are, uh, are most suitable for halfway houses. And then here are some groups that we identify that would be poor choices for that, for that system. Uh, and then, you know, we, we would be able to get data from that and figure out what, what are the best uh, practices. I think it would help our friends uh, who, are, who are operating these halfway houses to know what type of analysis has been made prior to the person showing up on their doorstep and uh, might help us in the future. I just think that it introduces a little bit of accountability. It, it's not perfect. It's not, it's not rocket science either. But uh, it may help us in serving the people that we're, we're trying to serve and it may uh, it may use the taxpayer money in a more efficient manner, which is, which is always uh, desirable. Uh, look, we, we've had a, a, a very good exchange here. I think this panel has suffered enough uh, from the, uh, the questions of the committee. I, I would uh, uh, assure you that all of your testimony has been entered into the record, uh, with the exception of, of what I've asked uh, you to supply uh, uh, in, in the coming let's say two weeks I'd like to have some of that information regarding uh, the payments that Mr. White has asserted that uh, he's, he's making for for no services after departure uh, I want to thank you for your willingness to come before this committee I want to thank you all for your good work uh, this is a tough tough area and uh, you're doing God's work out there trying to help folks and we appreciate that and uh, with that, this, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.